dialogue with one another. So come on in. If you see anyone in the hall, shout out to them. So welcome to our keynote roundtable, which we've called Food Justice and Farm Advocacy in the United States. We have six exceptional uh, people here with you today, and I'm so delighted they've come from near and far to be with us. I'm going to leave the introductions of them to Naomi Starkman, who is our moderator. And for that, I'm very appreciative, uh, and I want to actually introduce Naomi to you. Naomi Starkman is the co-founder and editor, founder and editor of Civil Eats, a blog that many of you may know. I think it's producing some of the most wide-ranging and substantive content online about the issues we're exploring here. And they are one of the three groups, including Gastronomica and Edible Portland, who are downstairs at the media table today. So in addition, Naomi co-produces Kitchen Table Talks, which is a local food forum in San Francisco. She's a board member of 18 Reasons, which is a nonprofit that connects community through food, but also includes a really interesting gallery space. They're about to move into a new gallery space in San Francisco, in fact. Um, in addition, she is on the Circle of Friends Council for the Community Alliance with Family Farmers. She has served as the Director of Communications and Policy at Slow Food Nation 2008, and it was out of that that Civil Eats was born. She's worked as a media consultant for a number of uh, renowned magazines and journals, and she was previously a senior publicist at Newsweek. She's also um, very involved in our issues in her daily life. She lives on a farm in Sonoma County in Northern California. And she is a food policy consultant and advocate who works for a number of different organizations and groups. So I'm so delighted to have her in this role. Please join me in welcoming Naomi and the roundtable participants. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Allison, and thank you all for being here today. It's a really uh, a pleasure and an honor um, to be here. And really, I'm excited to talk with these amazing individuals. Um, I don't know about you guys, but for me, this conference has been really interesting um, and very theoretical. And so what I'm hoping for today is to put some of that theory into practice. And I see these individuals as the foot soldiers in the food movement. They have their boots on the ground. They're doing the hard work uh, to make our food system fair and more just. And I'm really pleased to, to introduce them to you today and, and to talk to them. And We'll, I will be asking them some questions, and I um, invite you to come to the, um, there are two microphones here and line up, and if you have a specific question, please, you can either address it to one of the uh, panelists, or if it's a, just a general question um, as well. Um, one thing I want to say before I introduce the panelists is that Fred Kirshenman said in his opening um, keynote uh, panel that um, he thinks that the elephant in the room is uh, climate change or climate destabilization, as he'd like for us to think about it. And from where I sit and from my vantage point, I think the elephant in the room is structural racism. Um, and until we can address those issues around food justice, until we have people of color at the table, um, and until we are bringing out the issues that farm workers and uh, laborers are facing this country um, without whom we would not be able to grow our food by and large. We really are not going to get outside of the echo chamber. So um, with that little statement, um, I want to introduce our panelists here today. I'm really honored to sit next to Rachel Bristol. She's the Chief Executive Officer of the Oregon Food Bank. Um, she was appointed to the Oregon Legislative Task Force on Hunger Relief at its inception in 1989. And she served for 10 years, um, including several years as its chair. And from 97 to 2000, she was on the board of directors for America's Second Harvest, which is now called Feeding America, the national network of food banks. So please welcome Rachel Bristol. Um, down the row, and you guys can just wave and identify yourself, um, is Deb Johnson Shelton. Um, she is the president of the Lane County Food Policy Council. She is also principal investigator of the Communities and Schools Together, or CAST, for Childhood Obesity Prevention. It's a project funded by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development at the National Institutes of Health. Please welcome Deb. At 
the very end, um, representing the fine state of Wisconsin, is uh, Young Kim. He's the executive director of the Fondi Food Center, which is a nonprofit that connects inner city Milwaukee residents to local fresh food. He's also president of the board of the Community Food Security Coalition. Please welcome Young Kim. We have also with us uh, Tammy Morales, who is the principal of the Urban Food Link in Seattle. It's a consulting firm specializing in connecting communities to healthy food. She is currently launching a really interesting corner store conversion project that aims to build demand for healthy food throughout King County and Seattle. Please join me in welcoming Tammy. And last but certainly not least um, is Chris Sh uh, Schreiner. He is the executive director of Oregon Health. Um, he grew up working on his family's farm, um, Shriner's Iris Gardens, um, which is a third generation 200 acre nursery, Iris Nursery in Oregon's Willamette Valley. And um, he coordinated the certification process for over 400 farms participating in the Oregon Tilth Certified Organic Program, and he's the quality con control director um, where he oversees policy analysis and managing accreditation with the USDA National Organic Program. Please welcome Chris Schreiner. Thank you. Oh, Cynthia, how could I have forgotten you? Well, her last name starts with a T, so she's at the very end of the biography, so I apologize. You will not forget Cynthia, I promise you. Cynthia Torres, um, she's the director of the Col Colorado Farmers Marker Market Association. She began her career in agriculture um, in a grain silo on an organic farm in Boulder County, and she is now the director of the Colorado Farmers Market Association and a former fellow at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. She serves on the Boulder County Food and Agricultural Policy Council, the Colorado Farmers Market Working Group, and the Community Food Security Coalition's Board of Directors. Please welcome Cynthia Torres. Okay, I think I got everybody. So I'd like to just start this conversation, and it's something that um, my colleague Leslie Hatfield and I have been doing as part of the social media part of this conference. We've been asking individuals and doing short videos and asking folks, what does food justice mean to you? And it's a question that's very hard to synthesize, but I think it's our duty to try to put words to. So I'd like to just first start by asking Cynthia and then each of the panelists here, in your region, in your work, what does the practice of sustainable agriculture mean to you, and how do you define food justice within that context? Can everybody hear me? Okay. I can hear my heartbeat. <laughs> I can feel it in my foot. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, so what is sustainable agriculture to me? What does it look like in my, my county and, and food justice? What does that mean to me and what does it look like? Um, I think, first off, I, I don't know that it's real helpful for me to talk about what sustainable agriculture means to me because really I think sustainable agriculture um, means something different to, to everyone, to each one of you, uh, depending on your history, your culture, um, the things that you value. Um, that's going to that's gonna determine what's, what's important to you in, 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 in your food choices and in agriculture and your community and what you advocate for um, as a consumer, as an activist. Um, when I think about uh, sustainable agriculture, um, I think that in order to have a sustainable, a sustainable agriculture system, it's more of a process than a product. And um, that's difficult for some, you know, if everybody wants the right answer. Um, but... Uh, you know, the right answer is in, you know, what comes out of uh, the, the conversation between um, different uh, people and their, and their values around sustainable agriculture. So I really think that it's, it's more of a conversation um, than a product. Um, just in my county, um, the whole idea of food justice is, is trying to bring together and make, um, develop an environment where, where people can come together and everybody has equal access in that conversation about, about their food values and about agriculture. Um, and we will be successful if we um, allow for that conversation to happen and allow for um, everybody to have a, have a, a, a voice in it. Um, one of the, some of the things that we're doing locally, uh, just trying to open up the table, you know, we have... Uh, 
um, on our food policy council several several farmers different members of our community we have conventional farmers GMO sugar beet farmers we have organic farmers um, we have different people involved in different aspects of the food system and nutrition and health uh, um, eco cycle or, or, or um, waste management so sustainable agriculture in my community um, involves GMOs I mean because they're at the table um, and maybe some of you might not agree that that's you know the best approach to take but it's really about being inclusive um, some of the things that we're doing to promote um, uh, access we have different programs in our county one is called the pearl program as people engaged in raising leaders and it's a way to go to underrepresented um, people in different communities and train train folks on how to participate in boards and commissions and how do you how do you get your voice out and how do you how do you share your values and how do you make your values um, uh, relevant in public policy um, we have lots of uh, you know different uh, organizations that we're trying to support you know at the farmers market and with the food policy council um, and you know immigrant rights they're they're it's incredibly important you know to us and we support the Colorado immigrant rights coalition we support you know it's it's about bringing in those partnerships about really making people feel like they're a part of the community um, so that's my idea of sustainable agriculture and food justice in my community and let's just start with you young before we come down the line okay. um, well for me I, I'd like to take on the food justice part um, food justice is social justice um, everywhere I look in the food justice movement I see hurt uh, we have whole communities that are getting screwed we have academics who are de being denied tenure because you know they, they may be too critical of Monsanto and a lot of folks with deep pockets um, there's a, a woman named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who came, came up with five stages of grief. That, does every, is everyone familiar with that? The five stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And so kind of a flippant um, um, illustration, say I lock my keys in the car. Stage one, denial. Oh, I did not lock my keys in the car. <laughs> anger, I locked my keys in the car. Uh, bargaining, um, maybe there, maybe the passenger door is open. You know, um, depression. Why do I lock my keys in the door, <laughs> in, in the car on the day I have an interview? You know, and then acceptance is, okay, let's find a locksmith or someone to open the car. Um, those are very five stages that people have to go through when they've gone through trauma. Um, there's also a, a Catholic theologian in Washington, D.C. named Clarence Williams, and he's added three more stages, um, re-engagement, forgiveness, and witness. Re-engagement, coming back to the community, uh, forgiveness, which is a hard one for me, and then witness, um, taking an active stand to make sure that, you know, this doesn't happen again. And so what I think we need in this, in this movement is space for people who have been wounded and ha who have been traumatized to go through these stages because they are human beings. And so a lot of times in conversations that I've been a part of, uh, say anger, that's a really difficult one to live with. But um, people need to be given the space to be angry and to uh, go through the process that we all need to go through in order to heal. Thank you, Deb. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I, I think um, for the Lane County Food Policy Council, which um, we've kind of been in existence for five years and another five years in development, so it's like a decade kind of community process that we're still in process with. So I agree with that with that part of it. But um, sustainable agriculture and um, I think. Uh, food justice are integrated and they're almost impossible to take apart and and for us we've deliberated a lot to kind of our guiding principles and I think um, sustainable agriculture and food justice are, are embedded and linked within all of that and first of all that we believe in um, access to nutritious food for all Lane County citizens um, 
We also believe that there should be a flourishing local food marketplace of, that includes farmers, processors, distributors, and the retail business. And um, protection, preservation, and restoration of soil. Um, we're doing work on um, looking at farmland preservation both within the urban growth and outside the urban growth boundaries because we believe there's a connect between rural and urban in terms of our food system and our livelihood of our community. Um, and um, also, and it includes the uh, recycling and reuse of all that we create. And that's a huge part of what we're working on even here in Lane County. Um, in a lot of sectors, there's a lot of effort to the recycling and reuse of foods in the schools and those types of things. Um, and the, the safe working conditions is also um, a very important attribute of um, a sustainable agricultural system. Um, that's part of what we've struggled with historically in terms of um, um, farm, farming um, capacity as, as well as looking at the health of, of farmers. And um, interesting, I was reading an article this last week on um, on how you can tip um, uh, farmers from going from conventional to sustainable agriculture. And one of the indicators that, that has been found is looking at the presence of, of toxins in well water and um, groundwater, and that that has a, a very uh, dramatic effect on decision making among farmers to start moving towards um, sustainable agricultural techniques. So, um, it plays a lot into people's consciousness and values at a lot of different levels. Um, also, we believe a lot in the education and outreach, and that is a huge, for me personally, a very large agenda item. Um, a lot of what we talk about doesn't go down to um, the community, neighborhood, citizen level, and working at a community level. So there's a huge need for um, educational outreach, emergency preparedness. Um, food is often exclusively lacking in any emergency preparedness plan from municipality, including here in Eugene, though we're starting to work in those directions. Um, and also ways that programs mitigate local food security um, caused by changes in both the energy, climate, and our food supply. So. Those are, we see the system as being so integral and interconnected and people that are working in all these facets of, of the food system are working together to create a sustainable system and we need to rebuild our whole enterprise. Yes, we do. Chris? Um, so for, for Oregon TILF, I'll start with the sustainable agriculture and food systems perspective. Uh, our organization's historical roots go back about 35 years ago and uh, the formation of TILF, which was a regional nonprofit organization. And the founders at that time, when they crafted their mission statement about the kind of agriculture and food system they were trying to advocate and support, uh, they used two key terms. And one was biologically sound. It had to be biologically sound. And the other was it had to be socially equitable. And I think that those have really held up over time as the discourse about more sustainable systems has, has gone along. So I think it really speaks to the visionary uh, perspective that those founders had. And also that those two pieces are, are complementary. You can't have a food system in an agriculture that's just biologically sound and not socially equitable and vice versa. Um, and for Oregon Tilth, another part of the sustainable ag system uh, really comes down to transparency and integrity of the food system. And so from a consumer's perspective, that really means that the ability to, to understand and, and know the story behind the food that you're buying, and uh, that gets down to questions like how, you know, how was the food grown, what were the practices and the impacts on the environment, uh, how are the workers treated, where, where did it come from. When you've got a very short supply chain, access to that info is, is pretty readily available in farmers markets, CSAs, you can have those conversations. But um, as most of us know, even with the rise of farmers markets and CSAs, a lot of the food that reaches us um, has quite a long supply chain. And that's where Oregon Tilth since 1982 has offered third party organic certification as a way to try to protect and, and define uh, a sustainable system and provide a, a label in the marketplace 
that consumers can trust, and it also gives growers that are adhering to those standards access to markets and market premiums. Um, so to the food justice part of that, the question which is, as I said, equally important, as, as an organization that really advocates and promotes organic, one of the critiques that I often hear is it's high costs, and that's a very legitimate question and critique, and so I think while a lot of us in, in the room and in part of the conference today know that there's some accounting issues that don't factor in a lot of externalized costs of, of the cheap and convenient food that the dominant system has really promoted, uh, you know, it, the fact still remains that the high cost of organic food puts it out of reach to a, a certain segment of the population, and I, we can't deny that that's a reality. And, you know, from my perspective, access to affordable, healthy and safe food is a basic right. It should not be a privilege. But I would also say that while trying to protect and advocate for that basic right, there's another one that we really need to keep in mind, and that's providing uh, a fair price to the providers and suppliers of affordable, safe, healthy food. So there's, there's a gap there right now, and I think part of the, the conversation that we have to have is how do we fill that gap and, and kind of balance that equation so that Everyone's got access, but people that are producing it also are getting a fair price and, and can have a, a good livelihood. Yeah. Boy, this is complicated. <laughs> um, so I live in an urban area, and so I'm not a farmer. Um, but in Seattle, we have, um, in the last couple of years, really started encouraging urban agriculture and moving um, from the idea of people just doing gardening in their pea patches, their community garden programs, to really wanting to make a business out of it. And um, so we've had to change some land use codes and um, prepare ourselves or sort of catch up with with the interest in growing for commercial sale rather than for household consumption. Um, and so one of the ways that um, we are supporting particularly low-income families in doing this is um, there's, a, there's a partnership between Seattle Tilth and um, Verse for Prosperity, which is a community-based organization that supports refugees in South King County. And um, they are partnering to create a farm incubator project um, where they are working with uh, some Somali Bantu farmers, um, and I believe it was Emily who was talking about a similar project yesterday um, in Idaho. Uh, similarly, this project is targeted toward um, some recent um, immigrant and refugee populations in the in the community, and they're working on I believe it's a 10-acre plot. Um, so it's a really exciting project, and it's. Um, it gets to the food justice and food sovereignty question because for me what that really means is that you have the ability to control your um, food access and that you have um, are empowered to to take that into your own hands and so that's what these farmers are trying to do um, and what's very interesting about this is that they are growing not just for their own consumption um, they're growing obviously food that they prefer but part of the project is also to connect them with um, the healthy corner stores that Naomi was talking about. Um, so th these, are, these are two pieces of a larger um, grant that we have in Seattle and King County. Uh, so we're working on a, a project called Healthy Foods Here. It is a corner store project where we're trying to get uh, more healthy food into low-income communities. We don't have a lot of food deserts per se in Seattle, but we do have a lot of um, communities that don't have great access. And so we're working um, with these farmers because a lot of our, um, a lot of these stores in some neighborhoods of King County are also owned by uh, Somali um, grocers. So they're, they're small ethnic groceries. They sell halal meat. They sell particular products that, um, that that community wants to buy. And so part of this effort is to get uh, a real business chain going so that they're growing food for themselves and they're going to sell to these corner stores and then they supply the rest of the community and so um, for me that's just a really interesting example of how you can start to build on a very small level um, a more sustainable little food system um, that is also helping um, target a particular population. That's great. It's a great example. Rachel? 
Well, I think they've just about covered everything. <laughs> oh, it's always hard going last. Um, sustainable probably comes more from my personal life than, than uh, my work in many ways. As someone who grew up in Washington County back when it was all fruit orchards and berry fields and beans and so forth. Um, and as someone who is dealing with hunger um, and the lack of access to food through normal means, like going to the store and buying it, um, I am deeply concerned about um, losing our agricultural lands and our access to local healthy foods. Social justice, I believe food is a basic human right, and uh, I have worked for nearly 30 years now um, and have not been successful in creating a public will uh, to ensure that all people do have access to adequate healthy, culturally appropriate food. We're getting further and further away from that, frankly. And to me, one of the biggest challenges, and I think, Chris, you, you spoke to this a little bit as well, is the whole economic structure of our food system is not working. And, you know, we totally ignore the farm workers that are being paid slave wages or the family farms where people are just barely able to uh, meet their basic needs. Um, they may not go hungry, but they don't have much of anything else. Um, so it's a, it's a huge issue. Um, we're now feeding close to a million people in Oregon and Clark County, Washington. And despite moving 40 million p pounds of food a year, our network moving 72 million pounds of food a year, it comes out to about four or five food boxes for the average household. And the way public policy is moving right now to reduce access to food for low-income families through cuts that are happening at the federal level, um, to me says we're moving <laughs> toward a less just future. Um, and so I would encourage you to learn about those policies and programs and to be an advocate for them. So now you get to go first. Oh boy, <laughs> keep talking. And it's actually a question that's sort of in response to what you all said. So how, what would make regional food systems in your area more socially just? What are, what are the things that you would love to have to be able to see I mean, you just said you were, have been working on this issue for 30 years. And I find it really hard to believe, especially now when we see such a burgeoning food movement, that there's still so many roadblocks. So what would make a difference for you and each of you, for each of you in your work, to make, to make it more socially just? Well, again, I think we have to deal with, with the whole economic structure of food. And, you know, maybe it's, uh, we're talking to Blumenauer about changing the way farm subsidies are used and I, you know there's some potential there since that is such a big piece of the economic um, picture. Um, we're also working with stores that have resulted in um, lack of access to food in rural Oregon um, to be the distribution system to get access to fresh fruits and vegetables milk and dairy and, dairy and uh, meat products that in particularly Eastern Oregon, you know, families used to have these small general stores where they could access uh, product and local farmers could sell some of their products. But with some of the major chains coming in, people are now having to drive 50, 75 miles to get a gallon of milk. Um, so we're working on access primarily by bringing communities together. Um, and I think it's particularly true in Oregon. You don't walk in with a solution. You walk in with an offer to uh, talk about what the issues are and bring the people who are interested in it together to create their own solutions. And we see that happening in everything from expansion of uh, nutrition programs, 
um, organic gardening education programs, more and more people growing a portion of their own food. So they're, um, they have a little bit of sustainability. Um, but in the long run, I think in terms of the population that we are serving, we could literally solve hunger tomorrow if we consolidated some of the min many federal food programs um, and the food stamp program and fully funded it so that when, and recognize that what we use as the poverty figure is not even a su subsistence level living anymore, um, to change the definition so that to me, a just world is people having the ability to go to the store and buy the food that they want and need to keep their families healthy. Um, I think you sort of hit the nail on the head. Um, I think access is obviously an issue, um, and it's the most acute issue for many households. We have to be able to provide people with food. Um, but how they get that food is the real question. And really, when you get down to it, hunger is an income issue. And so until we start addressing the fact that people are not making livable wages or don't have access to jobs or job training, I think we're going to continue to circle, hopefully not for another 30 years. Um, but I think two things that come to mind um, when we're talking about the food system in particular. One is um, that we need much more investment in scale appropriate um, infrastructure for smaller farmers, particularly for us in, in uh, King County. Um, we have lots of small farms, but they don't have the ability to access processing facilities. They don't have sorting, you know, um, packing sheds on their, on their land. They don't have access to um, um, distribution facilities, and it's because the, the, there has been a divestment from that kind of infrastructure for smaller and mid-sized farmers for so long that it's just not there. Um, and so if we're, going to, if, we're, if we're going to ask our our farmers to grow enough so that we can all eat our five a day, then um, we're going to have to help them get that product to market, and uh, right now they just can't do it. So, so one thing I, th I think we need is some investment in um, some more scale appropriate regionals, regional infrastructure. And then the other thing coming from, um, like I said, an urban area, I really think we need to start supporting the food sector as a sector. You know, in Seattle, our Office of Economic Development has, I think, five different clusters, business clusters that they support with small business development and job training and workforce development and they, you know, do this sort of investment in aerospace and software technology and um, biotech. But when you start talking to them about the food system, they really just think of it as more programs that government has to fund so that they can try to solve the hunger issue. They don't even make the connection that there's a possibility for this to be a wealth creation strategy or business strategy um, or economic development strategy for the region. Um, and so I think we need to start talking about this work in that way so that we can get our elected officials to pay attention to it. Um, and, and once we have that, uh, that, that's what's so exciting about food policy councils and, um, and other entities that are really trying to engage elected officials to get them to pay attention to this. So um, I see potential, but it really means that we have, to, um, we have to start talking policy talk and we have to start talking economic development and business talk if we're going to get the kinds of changes that we're looking for. So uh, yesterday, one of the sessions, uh, Dalton Hobbs, who's an administrator at the Oregon Department of Agriculture, shared two statistics that were pretty striking. Um, one was that 80% of the food that's grown in Oregon is then shipped outside of the state and sold elsewhere. And the other statistic was that 50% of the students in the public schools um, now qualify for either reduced or free lunch, meaning that those students that, you know, they're their best meals of the day are probably occurring at the schools. And so when I start thinking about, you know, a more sustainable regional food system and developing uh, a regional food economy, I think about those two statistics. And for me, one real concrete strategy to trying to turn some of those statistics in an improved direction is developing better and stronger relationships and policies that really 
uh, are designed to leverage the purchasing power of institutional food services. So campuses, hospitals, mm -hmm. foods, there's a lot of meals that are served at all of those kinds of uh, institutions that are not currently putting a primary uh, incentive on sourcing locally and, and featuring locally. And so there's some great work being done in Oregon ar around trying to change that. Um, Oregon Tilt is a partner with the Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility on a project that's called Healthy Food and Healthcare. And the radical concept there is that hospitals are places of healing and food is a fundamental, you know, part of, of being healthy. And so just designed to work with hospital food service, uh, food service, uh, sectors to purchase more sustainable and locally regionally produced food. Um, and also the, the whole farm to school movement is uh, another one that's happening nationally here in Oregon, the, both in the Department of Education and the Department of Ag, they've got two uh, dedicated positions to trying to create those linkages. So I think that's one really great strategy. And I would echo what um, Tammy was saying about the you know, scale appropriate uh, infrastructure. So if we're going to try to add value to our, our local food, we've got to have the, um, the value added processing, the storage and the distribution in place to, to be able to deliver to those kinds of institutions. It can't all be fresh market. So that's an important part of the equation as well. And um, kind of the third concept that I would put out there is while um, you know, the, the small to mid-sized farms and the direct markets are, are a very powerful and viable way to, to start to change our food system. There's a certain, you know, uh, efficiency and, and scale that they just can't compete at when uh, compared to the, the, the more vertically integrated and concentrated food system. So one model to kind of try to achieve those economies of scale and those energy efficiencies is through cooperative structures. So, you know, uh, companies like Organic Valley or country natural beef or shepherd's grain are, are taking small and mid-sized farms but marketing under one brand and, and using kind of the you know that collective partnership to really achieve some of those efficiencies and uh, scalabilities um, so I think that's another helpful strategy and model that there are success stories out there okay. well and I, I think another area where we can do a lot of work is at the community level, which I keep coming back to or probably will, um, in that a lot, like at a community level, we already have a lot of um, really experienced, longstanding um, organizations and um, entities that are doing all of this work. And one of the things that I don't feel we've done very well is actually recognize them and bring them into bring them into the picture and empower them to actually help heal and bring our food system back in order. Um, in the Community and Foods, um, Communities and Schools Together project, what we're actually doing is working with a host of community partners, Willamette Farm and Food Coalition, with, um, with Farm to School and all of their expertise, um, working with ECOS, um, in, all of their work with agriculture and, the, and their experience with, with farming and the community there with the Bethel neighborhood and, and extension service on and on and bringing these people together and then start working at a community level with the people that live in the community. Um, we developed a, a parent advisory council with our project that works among all of our project groups. And this is the first time where a parent group has been kind of enlivened and brought up parents with young elementary school children who usually are struggling just to, to do the day-to-day -to, -day to help their children further along, young families that are themselves struggling in their own economic um, sectors of their lives, and bringing them into a health um, sector engagement with all of us to teach us about their values and to help us develop what we do and how we intervene with families and the schools and in the community. And, so I really believe that we've got a lot of the capacity here um, already within our communities of people that have spent the decades doing the work that know how to, um, to have the relationships with um, the knowledge base, the experience, and the other people in our community who are leaders and, and can bring this together and start building this capacity and work with who we have already in our midst. And, and use the, 
those strengths of those groups and people to help work at a community level to foster this healed system. So. Thank you. I can't really imagine what a sustainable um, agricultural system looks like, but I can imagine and I do see what um, we can do as people to create a more sustainable agricultural system. Um, and I think that what we're um, creating a more just uh, food system is just going to depend on our priorities and where our priorities lie. Um, for several years, the Colorado Farmers Market Association has been trying to work with our state WIC office, uh, Women, Infants, and Children, to, um, to bring the Farmers Market Nutrition Program to Colorado. And that's uh, the, the, the coupon program um, WIC recipients can use at farmers markets. Um, well, there hasn't been um, uh, a lot of effort put towards making that happen. And um, as soon as Michelle Obama came out and said that farmers markets were important to reducing obesity and creating, you know, and growing healthy children, a week later I got a call from the state WIC office saying, we would like to talk to you um, about farmers markets, about farmers and about um, the WIC coupons, the, fr the, the fresh fruit and vegetable voucher programs um, that, that uh, WIC recipients are now receiving. And it took a little while, but it became a priority. And now we're sitting down, you know, trying to figure out how to make that work. We're trying to rewrite the, 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 the retail handbook so that farmers can participate and become vendors and accept those cash value voucher, the fruit and vegetable vouchers um, from WIC customers in their communities. It was a matter of priority. And, you know, <laughs> I, I, I think it, we can really uh, um, spend a lot of time tr struggling to figure out what that institution is going to look like, what that system is going to look like, but it really does depend on the people. Um, I remember yesterday I, I heard in um, one, of the, one of the panels that it's not the science, it's the people that can make or break you know, uh, a, a system or can, can, can create justice or injustice in a system. Um, just another example um, is a matter of uh, priority. Um, Shelly Allen is the, the school food service director with the St. Brain Valley School District in, in, um, in, Boulder, in Boulder County. And um, she, she is really interested in you know, farm to school movement. Um, but Shelly's a little bit different in that she wants to work directly with farmers. She wants to make that connection happen. And so she calls and she says, I want names of farmers. This is a real priority. I don't know if it's going to work, but I'm going to try it anyway. And it was really um, moving forward um, in the face of adversity <laughs> and, and against sort of institutional um, uh, barriers that people are going to make a, 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 the system, the institution more just. Um, you know, when we were dealing with, um, I, I have, I also have another job, by the way. Um, I, I work with Boulder County Parks and Open Space in their Agricultural Resources Division. I'm a, I'm a local food distribution uh, specialist, and um, we have 25,000 acres of, of public land dedicated to agricultural production. And um, most of that is, is commodity crops. We have wheat, we have, you know, different uh, um, barley, corn, sugar beets, you name it. We have lots of um, uh, uh, large-scale products being grown on that land. Well, the community said, you know, we want more access to the products on the land that we pay for. And so it became a county priority, which is why I have my job. They created a job. Um, to take a look at how to um, redistribute, how to market the marketplaces for those products in our county. It's just a matter of priority. Um, and I really think that food policy councils have a real good um, opportunity to say what the priorities are. And engaging people in your communities and low-income communities um, is, is a real um, essential component to identifying the priorities. Um, I'm going to answer the question about um, what things in, our, in Milwaukee would make things more socially just. Um, I think we need to pay more attention to social sustainability. Um, as an example, 
at our farmer's market. We run a farmer's market in inner city Milwaukee, um, about 24 farmers or so. And every year we have been having this thing that we call the Greens Throwdown. Um, it's a cook-off, it's a contest. To, we invite neighborhood chefs to come in and cook their family greens recipe. And is everyone here familiar with collard greens and mustard greens? Yeah. Okay. It's good stuff. I'm not, a, I'm not a food historian, but I suspect um, when people were much more physically active, um, this was the kind of thing, you know, it has a lot of salt, it has a lot of fat. Um, you know, the things that are not so good for us now, now that we sit behind a computer and we just move a mouse and file, maybe. Um, but when you were much more physically active, you had to eat that kind of stuff, and it was economical. And uh, you had to eat it or else you would just kind of wither away to nothing when you were working, um, doing a lot of uh, heavy lifting. So um, we have this greens throwdown. We invite community to come in and cook. We have a, a, a distinguished panel of folks who taste, and we, arrive, we award first, second, third prize. Last year, second and third prize were recipes that were completely vegetarian and completely salt-free. Um, I wish I could take the credit for that happening, but um, it's, it's the community. Uh, folks are looking at their family recipes, and they're saying, you know, we need to change this. And so they're putting their generational stamp on a recipe before handing it on uh, to their kids. And a question came up um, in one of the earlier um, workshops or discussions, um, how do you change the palates of people in a non-coercive manner? I think, at least what's happening in Milwaukee, is the people who are changing the palates and getting folks used to different tastes are, those folks are the mothers and the grandmothers. Um, they're teaching their families um, um, better eating habits. Um, and then also, when it comes to nutrition education, we do a lot of nutrition education, and we've tried it, a lot of stuff. And I think that my latest thinking is that we cannot have shame-based culinary education. We cannot tell whole people that um, what you're eating is bad. We can't say the recipe that your grandmother gave you is bad. Um, people need to take it upon themselves and they have the ability to take, up, take it on themselves to change recipes. I'm staging so. a revolt. Not really. No. This, I'm um, going to suggest as the organizer of this conference with the time we have remaining that we should start just throwing things open to the sure. audience. This is you. It's so, we're so lucky to have these people here today and I really want to maximize our time. Can I get a room host at each of the other wireless mics. I think it might be more dynamic if we can just hand people mics. So can I get some volunteers, maybe one at each of these grabbing a wireless mic? Um, so Naomi, do you mind if we start kind of opening up to let's questions? Go. We have some questions. And Naomi, at any point, if you want to redirect a question to sure. one on the list, let's do that. But I just think they've given us a lot to think about, these marvelous uh, advocates and nonprofit directors and consultants. So let's get it going. OK. Fairness. We'll kind of go in a kitty corner. We'll kind of go this mic, that mic, that mic there. So we get as many people in the room. And keep your questions. Again, if you were here at yesterday's morning session, it's velocity, speed. So keep your question to, you know, a minute max. Naomi is empowered to stop you mid-sentence. So not, you know, if you are one of these people who doesn't pause between sentences, that won't help you. Hello. Um, my question is for Cynthia specifically. Um, I think you have an exciting job. Um, you said it's a matter of priority, and so now that the government has prioritized and created your position, do you feel empowered to enact the change that you see is needed in the system, and what are your successes? Could you repeat that question, and who were you addressing it to? To Cynthia. Oh, okay. Um, so it's a... You said it's a matter of priority, and now that the government has prioritized and created your position, 
Do you feel empowered to enact the change that you see as necessary in the system? And what are your successes as a result of that? Well, I think I've always felt empowered. Um, <laughs> but I, I, it helps to have support. Um, and I think that that's part of like the, the, the real key to sustainable agriculture is building those relationships and those support networks and how we can um, use our government and use our NGOs and use our, uh, you know, you know, our public-private um, businesses, enterprises, and, and people to help build those, those networks. And certainly whatever the, the government can do to um, support um, our success is, is welcomed. And, and yes, it was definitely... Um, empowering to have Michelle Obama say that farmers markets matter. Um, that's that that was tremendous. Um, every you know that we we have you know phone calls from rural development office wanting to fund uh, um, food stamp snap machines at farmers markets. You know because it was a priority. They they want to support farmers markets as, as a, a means for food access. So that that helps. But um, I, I I don't think that we should wait um, for, 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 for the government um, to, to, to empower us. I think, you know, empowerment comes from, from here. Maybe we should go back there, yeah. Thanks. Um, good morning. Uh, it's surprising to me, so I, I'm not at school here, and I'm interested in going to Oregon State, which is our land-grant college, mm -hmm. um, but we're not having this discussion at the land-grant college, so I'm wondering how the extension service at all, if at all intersects with some of your programs, um, and what role do you see that, if any, playing in the future in the food justice movement? I can take an initial stab at that. So, uh, yeah, the, the land-grant universities, uh, when I first started working for Oregon TILF, which is about 12 years ago, uh, organic was not a word, on, and food justice certainly wasn't really a concept that was being really discussed in the land grants. But I will say that that has really changed, um, especially at OSU. And I think one of the reasons is because of priorities at the, at the government level and uh, at the federal level. The 2008 Farm Bill did um, allocate, you know, we saw a five-fold increase of funding for organic-related programs to $100 million of mandatory funding. Um, and some of that was for organic research and extension initiatives. And so, um, you know, the land grants are in a, a tough position where they're, you know, like all the public universities, their funding from the general funds are getting cut, cut, cut. And so their priorities are really driven by the, you know, who's willing to sign the checks. And so if there's government funding to support organic extension and research, then suddenly you've got researchers and extension service uh, that's, that's interested in doing that work as well. One of the partnerships that Oregon Tilt has uh, recently developed in the last two years with uh, OSU's Small Farms Program is uh, basically helping to set and prioritize uh, some of the research and ed education and outreach that they do. So through this partnership, TILT is actually providing some supporting funds to their small farms program. And in exchange for that support, we've been able to prioritize some of the work they do. So they're on the research side. They're doing on-farm, participatory base with the growers, cover crop research to really articulate how use of cover crops can meet plant nitrogen needs. Um, we're also uh, supporting a program that they call Growing Farms, which is a, a, a multi-week course for new and beginning farmers to teach them not only how to how to be successful, sustainable growers, but you know the other part of that is how to put a, a sustainable business plan together because that's part of being economically viable as a farmer. Um, and then we're also um, partnering on uh, doing an ongoing needs assessment of our stakeholders. So reaching out to our farmers to really identify what are their challenges, what are their obstacles to start informing the research and education agenda at OSU. So I think that that's starting to, to change and there's more interest, but it's all contingent on that funding support to, to from partners like Oregon Tilt and from the federal government. And uh, the 2012 Farm Bill cycle, which is getting underway now in the current federal environment, of, you know, it's all about what are we going to cut in terms of expenses. I think a lot of these new programs are really at risk. And so something that you all can do, and I encourage you to do, if you think that this is important work, even if it's new and it's currently, you know, focused on what might be a, a small percentage of the food system, it, it represents the future of the food system. So we should not quit funding it because that's, that's a sure way to, to not make any progress. And I, can I... 
Right. They are also uh, working on a community food systems conference for next January. So speaking of the Farm Bill, um, I should give a plug to um, our Seattle City Council President, Richard Conlin, um, who kind of spearheaded an effort to get some uh, the Seattle Farm Bill principles created. Um, so if you haven't seen them yet, I suggest you look at them because they're great. Um, uh, it's really focusing on a, um, supporting a health-focused, health-centered farm bill. So health of farm workers, health of the food system, health of, um, you know, encouraging um, production of actual food um, instead of, you know, just supporting commodities. Anyway, so you can look at that at seattlefarmbillprinciples.org. You can add your name as a supporter. Um, we're really hoping that it spreads like wildfire across the country and that um, maybe other municipalities do something similar or at least join on, sign on to the, um, onto the principles so that we can demonstrate that um, this is something that everybody needs to be paying attention to because we all eat and that bill affects all of us. So check it out and add your name. So maybe we take a question here. So my question is for uh, either Ms. Bristol or Ms. Morales. Um, I'm concerned about urban agriculture and given that there's a number of um, obstacles to um, small urban farmers bringing their products to the market, whether it's um, cost of land or um, cost of organic certification or whatever, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm curious if there's any efforts uh, to attempt to capture some of that surplus, um, not to go to the market, but more trying to um, bring that to maybe people that don't have the means to be able to uh, afford it. Whoever the, wants to the take products that themselves? Um, yeah, just, I mean, surplus from... Are you uh, talking about gleaning? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, gardeners who uh, produce more than they need, uh, people who are producing for um, CSA stuff mm -hmm. that maybe yeah. isn't mm -hmm. suitable for uh, distribution to their members, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, I don't know that, we've, that it's um, producing so much surplus yet, um, but there are, there are programs um, and, and smaller organizations in Seattle that are doing that sort of thing, so... There are um, urban garden shares where you can, um, you know, you're not allowed to sell product out of your backyard in Seattle yet. Um, but you can, uh, there's a lot of like growing, a ro plant a row for the food bank, that kind of thing. Um, and there, there is a four acre farm in Seattle called Mara Farms. Um, and they mm -hmm. are ex pretty much exclusively a giving garden, so they grow, there's a lettuce link program there, and the food that, that, that is grown there is um, specifically for the surrounding low-income community, um, and then they also give to the food bank that's in the community. So um, I think there are a lot of uh, pr projects that are up and running to do something like that. Is that your question? Rachel, you must yes, know we, we, we accept food from any place we can find it. <laughs> Um, you know, at all levels, from uh, the small grower to the big farms, working with farmers to do plant production for us, just like plant a row, working with the home gardener to plant an extra row, and then linking them up with agencies uh, in our network. I think there is a bigger challenge with kind of the uh, the home entrepreneur and. Uh, the legislation that just passed the uh, Oregon House, I believe, or was it Senate, around allowing the distribution of some home canned products at farmer's market and so forth will help us because we're highly regulated in terms of what we can distribute. It has to be labeled, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so that will give us more access. And we have explored from time to time one of the challenges for some of those smaller producers, uh, I think was mentioned earlier, about getting product to market. Um, you know, at some point, can our distribution system that's taking food out around the state bring some of those products back to other markets? Um, we haven't found a way to do that um, and keep up with the demand just for our services, but uh, that's something we'll be looking at in the future as well. Young, did you want to add? I, I just had something to throw out about urban agriculture in Milwaukee. Um, Milwaukee being um, a Midwestern city that has a strong industrial heritage, um, a lot of our, a lot of the African American population in Milwaukee moved up to Milwaukee from the South, uh, mainly Mississippi and Arkansas, is my understanding, and so. I've sat in meetings where um, folks who are trying to get urban agriculture established 
they've actually said out loud, you can't get black people to garden. And, um, you know, in talking to a lot of folks, um, African American folks who I work with, they've said that um, you know, a lot of families came to Milwaukee, came up north to escape from farming. Farming was exploitation. And their grandfathers and, and parents said, you know, we're moving here so that we don't have to farm again. And so um, there is uh, a garden um, in Milwaukee near my farmer's market called Alice's Garden, um, run by an African-American minister. Uh, she's got yoga in the garden. She's doing a lot of programming to help heal that rift between people and growing. And um, she's got a three-year waiting list. So it, it, it works if you pay attention to what people need so and their need to, to heal. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Can we go to the back? This is for Deb on the Lane Food Council, Food uh, Policy Council. I read this morning on the computer a letter from a plant pathologist from Purdue, 50 years experience, the letters to Tom Vilsack, talking about his research, 1,000 cows uh, fed uh, feed that has been associated with glyphosate, the herbicide, 45% miscarry. None of the 1,000 cows who were fed uh, feed without the glyphosate miscarry. Is there anyone on the Food Council that is helping to educate the farmers about some of these changes in our food system and so they can make educated decisions for themselves? Um, <clears throat> that's a really good question. Um, the, one, the one thing that uh, one of our counselors has helped us with is a, um, a policy around genetic modified foods and, and that type of thing. And so this is an area where we're beginning to work in, but um, the, the challenges that you're describing are quite extreme. I know I, 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 there was also an article in the paper um, through uh, um, the um, concerned scientists um, talking about the same same types of things going in our food system, and I think that's a really good a really good area for us to be working in, um, and it's an area that's uh, needs a lot of development. I, I can't say we've got a lot other than trying to work through the policies and work through the types of uh, legislative changes that are going on right now in Oregon. Question here. Um, Ms. Bristol uh, briefly uh, touched on the topic, but uh, my question is, um, do you see uh, restructuring the uh, commodities from, um, or I'm sorry, the subsidies from commodity farming to more of food crops grown um, as a solution um, to some of bridging that gap that uh, Chris Schreiner talked about? Or is it kind of like a Band-Aid fix that might get some farmers into the same situation that a lot of those commodity farmers are in where it's, uh, it's not economically feasible? Cynthia, did you want to take a stab at that? I'm just going to use one, one example um, for what's going on on our public land in Boulder County, um, where there's a, an interest by the county to um, move some of our commodity cropland into specialty crop productions or fruits, uh, primarily vegetable crop production. Um, right now, with our land use codes, um, it makes it very difficult to provide um, some of our specialty crop farmers with um, the infrastructure they need to, to, develop, their, to develop their businesses um, on the land. Uh, there's a lot of uh, significant um, resource investment in land for specialty crop production, the, the wells, the, 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 the infrastructure, the electricity, all that. So it, you know, when we're looking at, you know, gosh, how are we going to, how are we going to move 25, is it even feasible to move 25,000 acres of, of um, commodity crop land to um, specialty crops? For one, we have water um, issues. Um, only 13,000 acres of that is, is actual irrigated um, crop land. So, it, gosh, I mean, Maybe Chris or something. I mean, it, it's it's tremendous, and we're trying to work out, you know, with the conservation easements, with with public land, with the infrastructure needs, the land use code. How do we all work together to try to figure out how to 
how to move some of that production. We have one small, um, it's called a growers association. We have a few specialty crop farmers who are coming together um, to lease a piece of land from the county that's been in hay production, a little bit alfalfa. Um, it required about $30,000 of initial investment to get the pumps and the electricity um, to, to that particular parcel. And, and it's, that, that's significant because we won't, we won't get that back anytime, anytime soon. So, um, I don't have a whole lot to <clears throat> add. I guess to just to speak to the, the question of the subsidies of the commodity subsidies is a, is a form of policy, and obviously that is one of the big drivers that has led to these, you know, um, cheap foods that where those externalized costs aren't reflected. But I guess I would say, you know, it, I think that needs to change. I think that's a bad policy, and it's it's one of the primary drivers for some of the, the things that are wrong with our food system currently, but um, it, I think it would also be a mistake just to pull those subsidies from those farmers without having established the infrastructure and the support and then the technical training to transition those farmers to a different kind of food system, because to do so, you're just going to drive those farmers off the land and, you know, as we, you know this mm -hmm. land use and land conversion, I mean, that's the worst thing we could do in terms of food security for our country and for our region. So it's got to be a, a gradual shift over time. It, it, it's the solution is not just simply cut the subsidies and throw the money someplace else. You've got to really provide a, a retraining and in the infrastructure to help those farmers stay on the land, bring new farmers to the land and, and diversify. I think the other thing we have to remember is how much of the world food supply we're providing a certain commodity crops and so I don't think you can it's not either or it's a little more of this and a little less you know especially the dead farmers there's no need to subsidize them so. in the back <clears throat> hi I am um, across this conference it keeps coming up that we need to work with business can you speak into the mic please sure it keeps coming up that um, we need to work with business, and I'm finding that our country runs as a business largely at the expense of social and at, at the expense of social and physical health. And this compromise seems kind of like a contradiction to me. So I'm looking at possible solutions like co-ops, as Chris has brought up, and and engaging our community, empowering our community, as Deb has spoken to. And I'm I'm wondering. What kinds of principles can we put to these new forms of organization and to rebuilding our community um, to focus on actually creating this social justice that we're all seeking? Businesses aren't inherently evil. <laughs> I mean, I run a $60 million business. It happens to be a private nonprofit organization. So um, I... I would just encourage you to uh, know that there are business people with values that um, are paying a livable wage. Um, I can talk to you about some food producers who are growing all their food organically. They're, um, again, paying livable wages that other processors aren't paying. And I think it's more about encouraging those kind of values uh, more broadly within our food production and distribution system. Sorry, so I just then I jumped would ask on that. <laughs> Sorry, Young, did you want to turn um, I, I, th I, I believe that people are rarely inherently evil. Um, I, I think, agree. I, I think that the corporations and institutions that they represent can be inherently evil. Um, so if you're sitting next to a Monsanto engineer um, on the plane ride back, um, you know, remember that they have inherent worth and dignity, and you know, they all have hearts, and you can talk to them. I uh, agree. I guess my question time. would be, for these businesses then that are coming forward to address these problems, what would be some key foundational principles that would preserve social justice within business then? I could, well, I could address at least a couple um, local examples um, uh, of businesses. Um, Wholesale Hummingbird, um, who invests and supports uh, agriculture producers that you have to provide 
a front end infusion of support to agricultural producers for them to be able to take that safe risk in producing. And so we have some businesses like that, organic, organically grown, um, uh, uh, um, I'm trying to think of our other couple of them, but we've got, we've got some in, kind of broker businesses here that are starting to develop these kind of models to fill this stop gap between the type of um, kind of distribution cycle we've had in the past, but investing in, in real people, in real producers with a knowledge base and a relationship. So I think those kinds of principles are actually starting to be developed and they're highly successful and very ethical and um, producing some really um, tremendous economic change as well as stability for our agricultural producers. And I just want to add that there, there are a number of businesses that realize now that they have to invest in the triple bottom line yeah. because consumers are demanding it. So it's really up to each one of us here. We have the power of the pocketbook to change the marketplace and demand that of businesses. Those principles to which you're speaking to, th those are up to us to tell the business, uh, businesses, corporations, what we want to see on the marketplace and how we would like for them to act as corporations. So um, in the front here. Yeah, this is for anybody on the panel. I'm a volunteer at Food for Lane County's Grassroots Garden, which is two and a half acres on Coburg Road here in Eugene. And I think um, the uh, idea that the coordinator out there has for how to feed people is for volunteers like myself to do the work and then uh, give the food away. And if this seems like a strange idea, I'd like to point out that um, in past years, in past generations, people produce food for themselves or for their family or their neighbors without the inter intervention of the market. And it's still that way in large parts of the world. But uh, it seems to me in our country, there's a problem that lots of people don't want to be gardeners or farmers for, as volunteers or not, whereas some people who would like to be farmers don't have the land. So my question is, how can we um, enable large numbers of people to go back to being farmers? It probably means the government has to be involved I mean, not just two and a half acres at a time, my point is right, but on a larger scale than that, because we're facing a big crisis, global warming and all that kind of thing. There is a young uh, farmers panel later today, which I encourage you to, to attend if you're interested um, to heed the call for 100,000 new farmers. But um, maybe Cynthia, you can try to answer that. Um, and this goes back to sort of utilizing partnerships and in, in really trying to build on each other's strengths. So um, our, our extension, and I have to put a huge plug into Colorado State University um, extension because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be where we are you know, with our food system in Colorado. They, are, they have been a tremendous ally and, and support system for us. Um, they, they, they are hosting um, five beginning farmer programs across, across Colorado. And um, they are, their primary focus is to grow farmers who are doing direct marketing, like say farmers markets. Um, they're working with the Colorado Farmers Market Association and the Colorado Farmers Market Association is also working with the Colorado Department of Agriculture and the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union to try to strengthen our markets so that um, they have viable markets to go to. So there, there's like this system, you know, sort of this infrastructure and system that has to be in place for, for farmers to be to be successful, um, you know, more than 50% of our farmers markets in Colorado are run by volunteers. And when we're, we have these five beginning farmer programs in, in Colorado raising farmers to go to those, go to those farmers markets, but they're, which are run by volunteers, that's not a real, a real strong system. So we still need to try to figure out how we're going to strengthen all those avenues and those pathways um, to become a farmer. Um, at the, the, the Lama Farmers Market was, uh, was also a manager for four years. Um, the biggest barrier for, for new farmers to get into the market were the food safety issues. Mm -hmm. We have tremendous food safety um, guidelines and, and, and there are more, we have the wrong idea about, about, about food safety. I think, you know, we, we, shouldn't, we should be educating 
uh, more than we are regulating, and, the, and, it's, and it's the other way around. And so I think, um, but I, I think that that's a huge component is the education and how to actually become um, a farmer and not just grow, you know, growing food in the backyard, but to actually drive the economic development with that agricultural practice. Anybody else? I'll just uh, and speak more to the, the backyard of the gardening scale and by, uh, by example of a, one of Oregon Tilt's programs that uh, we've had, it's in its 10th year, we call it our Organic Education Center, but it's again it's another example of these partnerships where um, in partnership with the city of Lake Oswego, uh, the city acquired a, a historic dairy farm called Lusher Farm, um, invited Oregon Tilt to come out and I, I'll give the city's credit that they really wanted to try to preserve the, the agricultural aspect of this site instead of turning it into ball fields or a golf course as, as parks. They, they wanted to retain the, the food production side of things, so they invited Oregon Tilt to come out, and we've got a 6,000 square foot demonstration garden that we use it for place-based, hands-on gardening education. And really, that's, that's an opportunity to change the mindset that, you know, uh, one of the reasons lawns became popular was it, it was this notion that you, you had arrived, it was a social status where you didn't have to grow any of your food, and so it was, we need to kind of turn that mentality around, and there's organizations like Food Not Lawns, those kinds of movements um, that can really start to change that, but um, now at that site at Lusher Farm, in addition to our demo garden, um, there's 200 community garden plots um, that subscribe it. And then they're also leasing some of that acreage to a uh, CSA and direct market farm that sells to the Portland area. And so as a site, it really has become a community hub and it provides a real opportunity to discuss a lot of the issues facing our food system. You've got different scales from backyard to community gardens to you know, direct market. And also you can look across the road and see urban development right there. And you can start to have that conversation about land use and protecting our prime agricultural land. So I think that through programs like that and partnerships like that, we just need to engender uh, a food culture and really valuing the, you know, the connection that you get from growing your own food, the empowerment that you get from growing your own food. And when you start to educate folks that way, it's really a nice segue to educating them on why they should vote with their pocketbooks for producers that are really adhering to principles of a food system that's sustainable. Hi, um, I organized with the South Central Farmers um, in LA last summer. South Central Farmers until 2006 had, um, I think the largest urban food garden in the States until it was ripped out through some political mess. Um, since then we have been able to build a farm 150 miles outside of LA and through a volunteer force, bring in low cost foods um, to South Central LA, one of the biggest like food deserts ever, but um, now the original land is back up for sale, 14 acres in the middle of South LA, but um, the land is really contested and we're having trouble with legislators and community council members to get the land back. And like as like a working class student organizer that has always been like really distrustful of government, I don't really know what I can do about it. And like y'all seem like you have a lot of work <laughs> working with city council. So um, if you have any like specific examples of what has worked when working with legislators and government. Tammy. I think we could all answer. <laughs> <laughs> Boy. Um, so, so this is a city council decision? Uh, do you have any support on the city council? Um, people say that they support us and then they turn around and don't support us. So one of the things that happened in Seattle that really started to turn around our city council was um, in 2008, Richard Conlon, who was not yet president, um, passed a resolution called the Local Food Action Initiative that really created a framework for how the city was going to think about food and, and understand how to engage in the food system. And um, so there was a public hearing about this resolution and to everyone's amazement there were people you know out the door at this hearing um, so I think you know obviously you have you have to get support there you have to have people ready to um, is there is there a piece of legislation that's under consideration or um, not that I know of okay so I would say try to 
whatever the process is for getting that land back, um, you need to engage your council members, and then you need to get as many people there. Um, I mean, you've all seen the pictures of what's happening in Madison right now. It's, it's really compelling when you've got the community behind you. Of course, I don't know. That governor doesn't seem to be paying attention. But, um, but you, you, you demonstrate the interest and you demonstrate the commitment of the community to, to what needs to happen and have people ready to tell stories. You know, what, what, why do they need this? What are, what's lacking? Why, why was it so successful last time? How is it impact? How are they impacted by this not being there anymore? Um, you know, what are the what's the potential if it is there again? And I think, um, you know, people are really afraid to engage with with their elected officials, but often they're the ones who are making some decisions, and they're they're not going to go out on a limb for you if they don't know that there's really support there. So, getting that, um, demonstrating to them that that you'll be there to back up the decisions that they make is, is key. Um, you know, since, since that resolution passed in Seattle, it's been a long process to educate the rest of the city council about these issues, and now we're getting really um, informed questions from them instead of dismissal. Yeah. Which resolution is that? It's called the Local Food Action Initiative. I don't know the number. I should. Um, but you can Google it. It's out there. Also in the back, was there another question? Oh. Uh, hi, I g this goes to anyone. Um, I teach food preservation privately. Um, and I was always interested because a lot of people, when they would take my class, would say that they're interested in this because they don't know what to do with their CSA baskets, which <laughs> made me realize that, um, or I thought that that was because they weren't cooking, not because uh, they didn't know food preservation. So I was just wondering about the role of, I guess it would be home economics or teaching people to cook again. Because um, I think there's a lot of access, or often there is, uh, but there isn't skills. And so when we were talking about um, less research and more education and what you think the role would be to start teaching people how to cook and how that might play a part in the food security issue. Yeah, um, our nutrition ed classes is is probably more about cooking skills and um, learning how to shop for food more economically, uh, less packaging, you know, high on the shelf, low on the shelf, um, how to cut up a chicken, those things that I think my generation probably was the last one that um, really had those kind of uh, classes and but still we're only able to well we've just expanded the program this year we'll move from training about 400 people to about six or seven hundred people a year and that is uh, that's a real need and something that uh, along with that that extension has played a big role in is teaching those preservation classes I think Part of the challenge, I think there is a lot of desire to learn. Um, I think a lot of the challenge for many low-income people is every day is so stressful just surviving. Uh, you, how do you keep the pieces together? Which bill do you pay? And, and what are the kids going to have for dinner? That finding time for those things um, can be challenging. So I, I think encouraging to put that education back in our schools, which kind of seems, seems like it's ridiculous to ask in today's uh, financial situation. But I think it is important to point out how important those skills are to people's um, ability to be self-sustaining. Yeah. Um, we have at, um, in Milwaukee, we've developed a curriculum called Youth Chef Academy. It's a 12 part curriculum aimed at middle school age kids. Um, we found that middle school age kids, at least in Milwaukee, um, are cooking a lot. Um, a lot of them are cooking up to four meals a week. And in focus groups, we ask them, so what are you making? And so, you know, microwave pizza, um, Kraft mac and cheese. Uh, one young lady said, I made mashed potatoes. And we said, great, how did you make it? And she said, I added hot water. Um, 
so uh, it is possible to have um, to develop cooking curriculum where uh, you start with just making popcorn, basic stovetop safety. Uh, turn the handle away so that when your little brother runs past, he doesn't knock the, the pot over. Um, and at the end of 12 sessions, you can hand kids a recipe, and they just fall on all the ingredients and just start chopping away. Um, so it is possible to, to um, uh, restart um, cooking skills in the community. Right, right here in the front. Okay, my question is for those on the panel who distribute food to the low income. Um, I was wondering, nobody's really touched on the aspects of social aspects of the poor. And having lived that as a child, one of the things I've noticed is that we have a structure built upon food stamps, uh, vouchers, um, waiting in long lines for cheese, let's say. All of these things, I believe, are psychologically impacting the poor mm -hmm. as making them feel really low um, on the, any kind of st socioeconomic yeah. structure anywhere. Is there any way, and I really have to say you guys have saved lives, literally, is there any way of doing this distribution and trying to preserve people's dignity? Absolutely. Um. <laughs> one of the one of the big things that we've been pushing, um, you know, most of the emergency food agencies are um, houses of worship where the congregation is volunteering, and a lot of them have been doing it for fifty, a hundred years, and don't want to change. But we've seen a real opening up to a different model of what we call a shopping pantry so that people can choose from what's available if they are going to emergency food programs. Other programs we've developed as membership programs. Um, in some case, very minimal, like $10 a year, and, but part of it is a newsletter that goes out to people. They're part of the distribution. They come together and figure out how the product that's delivered is going to be uh, shared among among the membership. Um, likewise, at what we call free farmers markets. Um, again, where people have a sense of community um, rather than the head down and I'm ashamed to be here that you often see in some of the traditional um, food programs. You know, unfortunately, it's just the it's the challenge of trying to move that out in every community. But we've seen some real shifts over the last five years. Uh, in particular, and you know, we're giving grants to agencies to buy shelving so they can do a shop through pantry. Um, we're doing everything we can to try to uh, absolutely. We realize that's an issue. Although there is a part of me um, right now. We've got a bunch of federal commodities and industry donations are down 25%. And there's a part of me that wants to go back and do a public distribution like back in the 80s with the free cheese just to draw our elected officials' attention mm -hmm. to how bad the situation is. I think that, you know, one of the unintended consequences of the buildup of the charitable food banking, food distribution system, is we give the impression that we're taking care of the problem. Yep. And we are just skimming the surface in terms of what the real need is. Um, so there also is some value in getting people out on the streets, too. Chris, did you want to add something? Yeah, just uh, two examples to, to speak to that very good point. Um, one is, uh, as I mentioned, we have the our demonstration garden. It's uh, 6,000 square feet. and, and in using that as a, a class site which produces food and we donate all that food and uh, we used to take that to um, local food banks but um, more recently we 
opened up an office uh, for that staff in Selwood, and it just happens to be located a directly across the street from the, one of the Portland Housing Authority buildings. So now, um, instead of taking it to a food shelter on a weekly basis during the harvest season, we just deliver that to the, the main mm -hmm. lobby. And you know what I've heard is that the residents now know what day of the week, and they're, they're waiting for that fresh produce to, to arrive and, and offer mm -hmm. it. So that, that's a, you know, a less shameful way to, to you know, receive that support. But getting more to the root of the problem, which I think is a really important uh, point, is there's a great organization in Portland, Growing Gardens, mm -hmm that's um, really approaching the hunger issue from a different right. angle. And, and what they do is they, you know, through their, their nonprofit work, they've got lots of volunteers and they will um, work with low income families to install raised gardening beds mm -hmm. and really teach those, those families and those households how to grow some of their own food in their own backyard and again, provide some of that support. And that really is an empowering experience mm -hmm. too. I mean, it doesn't solve the hunger problem totally, but it, it can make a big difference. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know. This we we should have a discussion. I I, I think some folks don't have time to garden. Yeah. So I want to take one last question, and I have my own last question. So um, would you like to ask the last yeah. audience question? Yeah. Um, so it's me again. Uh, <laughs> we have to start a change from somewhere. You know, we have to start a change from somewhere. And I strongly and I strongly believe that communities are where we can start the change. Uh, I personally think that foods is, food is not the basic rights of human. If, and I repeat, if we're using communities with low access to healthy food to write grants and creating jobs for others who necessarily don't live in those communities or in these communities. So my question is, how can we as a community-based organizations that are working in providing access to healthy food in those communities, let those communities know that the job belongs to them and, and, and that they need to start taking their own actions to, you know, finding solutions to the, you know, their own problems. Young, I think you, you said this yesterday was what we were talking about, so I'd love for you to take a stab at that first. Well, food is hot right now. And um, people who, I swear to God, I thought you had nothing to do with food, and you, you want to partner with me. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's, it's the hot thing right now. Um, organizations that are pretty big, and, I, and my agency is pretty small, you know. Uh, we just are concentrating on a two zip code area. Um, so, it, yeah, you. For me, a big part of my job is figuring out who's going to be with me in five years after food is no longer the hot thing. Um, and so I would hope that in your situation, you are doing some outreach to the funders and to the charitable foundations um, and making it clear that, that your solutions are community-based and not based on someone's idea of, of how to help um, help a community. Tammy? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> that was a question for you. Um, uh, you raise a very good point. Um, and this is something that I have started realizing in the last year or so. Um, the people, in my mind, who are missing from this conversation are the community development corporations, the community-based organizations that are really focusing um, much more on affordable housing issues and job issues in their communities, and who haven't yet, with the exception of a few, made the connection to food access in their communities. Um, and I think that's a great place to start. In Seattle, we have nine community development corporations in different neighborhoods. Two of them are working specifically on food. Um, but the work they're doing is great, and it's very community-driven. Uh, a lot of it is led by the youth, um, high school kids, and uh, college kids in the neighborhood. Um, in one neighborhood in particular, the Delridge community, the kids have been, they were funded through the Kellogg Foundation uh, food and fitness project, but those kids over the course of two or three years have gone from not understanding food at all to being in front of city council and demanding that the community council members take pay attention to their community. So 
Um, I mean, they're doing some great things. I actually, this was my hero's question. Um, they're doing healthy corner store work. They're doing um, very community-driven research, participatory research, health impact assessments. They're doing math in the market. So their farmer's market day, they have um, you know, uh, teachers from the elementary school doing first grade math problem, second grade math problem, and the kids go to the different stations in the farmer's market and do a math problem around food. Um, they're doing healthy food flash mobs, so trying to get people, you know, to congregate at one store that's selling something healthy. So, um, and because of all these little activities, the community is really changing its own conversation about food and the role of food um, in neighborhood planning. And that's how you get people involved. Um, from my perspective, I'm a planner, I'll just um, put that out there. Um, but it, it's been missing in, in Seattle that, that level of conversation at, at the neighborhood level has been missing from the neighborhood planning discussions and I think that a way to get the community more involved is through community development organizations and community-based organizations that acknowledge that there's a link between food justice and community economic development. Dia, did you want to add something quickly? Um, I, I was just going to say about, you know, uh, people coming in wanting to, wanting to help, wanting to get the funding to help and, and, and it's really important, and, and I think I'm speaking to a lot of folks from the university, uh, from universities. It, it's, it's, it's really um, difficult to develop partnerships that are fair, um, especially working with uh, um, community groups. You know, you, you have um, this, at least in my experience, um, people want to help, so they're going to write the grant to fund themselves to help you. And, well, that, you know, but, but they want us to participate with no, with no funding. And, and, and so it's just one more volunteer job, one more, and, and that's just not, that's not fair and it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important um, as um, potential supporters of communities out there to understand your role in in community development and 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 if you don't really if you have questions about your role um, talk to somebody about it um, talk to the communities talk you know and understand what what the real needs are what the, um, the, the the resource capacity for the particular communities you know are before you go in and, and apply for a grant to to support yourselves to, to become a helper and I, I agree with everything you've been sharing I think one of the things that with the economic development piece I mean we're looking at that NETCO is working to develop a food hub here in Springfield and they've gotten um, very interested in the arena of food with all of their work in the last few years and um, one of their members has come over to join our food policy council and one of the things that I look for is that if you're working in the community it's going to develop employment in the community. I mean, that's one of the other pieces that we're not talking about with economic development around food, that we need to start pulling that in at a community level in neighborhoods and regions of, of cities, bringing in and working in small rural towns that have these resources as agricultural basis, but don't have the benefit of getting these additional economic benefits from doing the work that they do. Um, at a community level. So I think one of the goals should be that there's, a, there's an employment and organizing within communities around food and the whole economic development enterprise. And we're seeing things like that starting to happen. Um, that it's a catalyst for these, for these relationship buildings and creating grants that are dedicated to building employment related to what we're all trying to create together. So I think it's a jumpstart it somehow. You have to get some funds somewhere to get the, get the beast going. But um, it, the goal is to actually create that life that starts to become sustainable. So yeah. on, that, on that note, I just want to thank all of you. And I, I really encourage everyone here to, to mind these experts because these guys are the doers. And each of them have so much experience and, and they're available to you. So they are your experts. 
Um, I'm, I hope that's okay that I'm, I'm offering you up, but um, I see them as my teachers, and I hope you do too, and we should give them a big round of applause for all their work. So I think it's, it's lunch. Are we, it's at lunchtime? Wait, it's, um, Allison, um, can you come up here? Oh, we have something. Actually, yes. Young has something for you. Um, Wisconsin being the state of cheese, um, I know you have a Tillamook cheese creamery here, and I've been there. And um, close, but no cigar. Um, I have, for Allison, as a gesture of thanks for putting on this thing, um, some special reserve 11-year-old aged cheddar. So... <laughs> We're now officially on a lunch break. Uh, and if you need any suggestions, if you're from out of town, look for any of us with a volunteer staff badge. Uh, and of course, I made that announcement earlier, but the food fair and exhibition hall is, of course, down on the first floor. This is a great period to go interact with those groups. I don't know. We should actually.